Welcome to each of you this morning, those of you joining in person here at 4th and Kentucky and those of you joining us online. We are glad that you're here. Whether you come with your heart full of joy or weighed down by sorrow, whether you come with more questions than answers, whether you come with lots of doubts or plenty of certainty, whether you come anxious about how God sees you or confident about God's wildly inclusive love, even for you, you are welcome here. There are a couple announcements I want to draw your attention to. The first is a reminder that we will observe Holy Thursday this Thursday by gathering in homes for a simple meal and communion together. There are about nine spots left. So if you are in the area and you haven't signed up yet, please do so today. Barbara Creasy will email confirmation to guests and hosts about the dinner location and who is attending where um, uh, tomorrow. You can sign up using the form in the bulletin or by emailing or calling the church office today. Also, if you are in the in Louisville area, I invite you to join me tomorrow evening at the 1020 Brewery in Butchertown to celebrate my 60th birthday. There will be cake, and you can find the details in the worship bulletin or in Friday's e-news. Looking past Easter, I just want to mention that um, I'll be leading a book study on a wonderful book I'm looking forward to talking about in April and May. The book is titled Awe, as in A-W-E, The New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life. And I think there are a lot of connections. It's, this is not a religious book, but I think there are a lot of connections for us as people of faith. So details about when we're meeting um, are in the worship bulletin and in Friday's e-news. And then another post-Easter event is a spring hike with teaching elder Sandra Moon. We'll meet up at Jefferson Memorial Forest on April 6th. And again, you'll find the information in the bulletin and in the e-news. And please contact Sandra to let her know that you're planning to attend. So if you're running late, we'll know to wait for you in the parking lot. If you're joining online, you can find the bulletin on our website, uh, the bulletin with the hymns, centralchurchky.org. And um, if you're joining on Zoom and have a prayer request, please drop that into the chat before the end of the sermon, and we'll do our best to get that um, included in the prayers of intercession. All right, on this Palm Sunday, let's just take a deep breath in and let it out again and let ourselves be here. And Melissa will lead us in the call to worship. Please join me in the call to worship. With crowds from ancient times we cry, Hosanna, save us. Oh, give thanks to the holy God, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Holy God. We bless you, Hosanna, save us. Let us pray. Holy One, we raise our palm branches and lift our voices to cry, Hosanna, save us. As we enter this holy week, turn our hearts toward you that we may follow you past the parades and into the shadows of betrayal, trial, and death. As we enter this holy week, give us courage to worship you with our whole selves.
trusting in the mercy and goodness of God and God's promise to forgive us as often as we cry out for forgiveness, let us without fear admit how we have failed to live as God intends and as we ourselves have intended to live. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Hosanna, we pray. Save us, God. Save us from ourselves when we trip over pride, doubt, or fear. Save us from the systems that keep us bound when we cannot see the way out. Save us from our sins when we feel their weight pressing on our hearts. Save us and forgive us. You have given us the greatest, clearest example of love. Heal us and help us to follow you. Even in the face of hatred and violence, we know that Christ loves us and loves the world. Even when enduring death, Christ cares for us and all who suffer. Even when we have turned away from God's ways, Christ forgives us and offers us new life. We are forgiven. Thanks be to the God of mercy and grace. all the children to join me up front for the journey. <laughs> it's a lot of children. and a friend. All right. I hope you're remembering to fill your fish bank with money to bring next Sunday for the One Great Hour of Sharing. And a reminder to all of you who don't have a fish bank, you also can participate in the One Great Hour of Sharing offering with a check, cash, or online with your credit card. So I want to tell you about one of our neighbors who lives in the country. She's one of our neighbors who lives far away in the country of Malawi, which is one of the countries in Africa. Her name is Tinan NG. Tinan NG. I had to say that a few times. Tinan NG. She's 42 years old. She's a widow, which means her husband has died. In fact, she had two, she was married twice, and both people she married died because of illness. So she's a widow, and she lives with eight other people in her house. Some are her children, some are her grandchildren, some are her nieces and nephews. That's a lot of people in a house, isn't it? It's a lot of people to feed. What? 18, that would be even more. Even eight plus herself is nine. That's a lot of people. And in 2022, so two years ago, the money people gave for the One Great Hour of Sharing 
helped people in Tinan Ng's, Ng's community build a bakery for women. And women could bake bread and rolls and maybe cakes and sell them and have money then to buy food that they needed for their families. And also in the bakery, farmers could bring what they had grown or raised and sell that food and then make some money so that they could help feed their family as well and buy things that they need. Well, last year there was a cyclone in this area where Tinan NG lives. Do you know what, have you ever heard of a cyclone? It's a terrible weather thing with lots of rain and lots of wind and lots of flooding, kind of like a hurricane. And it damaged the bakery. But money from One Great Hour Sharing helped um, Tina Nng and her other baker friends recreate the bakery so that they can bake again and sell things and have money to feed their families and the things they need. Now, Tina and Angie dropped out of school when she was 12 years old. She had to go to work to help support her family. Can you imagine that? Here, you'd probably be in seventh grade and you drop out of school. But she is one of the leaders in the bakery and she helps other women know what to do and helps them sell things and make baked goods. But do you think she wants her children and grandchildren to have to drop out of school, to have to work? No, she doesn't. So one of the things that she wants to save money for is to make sure that her children and grandchildren can go to school. And she said, I dream of them going to college and I tell them never be like me when it comes to school. I teach them to work hard, to love God, and always face challenges head on. And one of her coworkers said, Tina and Angie is the first to arrive at the bakery in the morning and the last one to leave at night. So she is a great leader and example. And she also said, I encourage people to give to the one great hour of sharing as a way to give directly to people. We are so thankful to the givers who fill their banks and send a check because we, the Malawan people, are the beneficiaries of your generous giving. So that's the story of a real person, one of our neighbors who lives far away, who is helped by what we give to the One Great Hour of Sharing. And you can bring your fish pranks um, and next Sunday. Let's say a prayer. I'll say one line. You say it back. Dear God, dear God, we pray for our neighbor T Nan NG. We pray for our neighbor T Nan NG and her family and community, and her family and community. Help them as they work at the bakery, help them as they work at the bakery, and care for their family and community. Care for their family and community. Thank you that we can care for our neighbors. Thank you that we can care for our neighbors, our neighbors near and far away. Our neighbors near and far away. Amen. Ready to pass the piece? The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Yes.
Missing the whole first page of my sermon. Huh. All right. Okay, so it might be on the printer tray at home. <clears throat> so, what I wanted to start out by talking about and I'll get to the scripture reading in just a minute, Um, is the reading is from John's gospel. And John is a tricky gospel to preach and read because it has been used throughout so much of Western history in really violent anti-Semitic ways. Um, John talks a lot about the Jews as if they are a monolith At the same time, everybody, almost everybody in John's gospel are Jews, including Jesus and the disciples. So one has to try and parse out, who is he really talking about? Um, And I think primarily he is talking about religious leaders. And John writes in the context of the late first century, probably early second century century, where there is a growing disagreement about how people understand who Jesus is. And there's a pulling apart and a fracturing of people who are Jewish and connected to the synagogue, and people who are Jewish and connected more to Jesus who are leaving the synagogue. And that disagreement has turned into very anti-Semitic tropes and writing, including by some of our church fathers, like Martin Luther, um, and have been used uh, in very violent ways 
to persecute people who are Jewish. And so in reading John's Gospel and preaching from John's Gospel, we want to be really clear that that disagreement that we hear so clearly in John's Gospel is not our disagreement. Um, that separation is what formed Christianity, and we are two related religious traditions that have some differing opinions, um, and yet in our day and time, hopefully we continue to work together, see each other as siblings, um, and I think it's important to say this all at this point, at the beginning of Holy Week, where the story ends up with Jesus. Well, it's the story, the end of the story is not Jesus' death, but we're getting to where Jesus will be murdered. And also, in our time, when there has been an increase in anti Semitic activity and statements um, in our own country that we have to call that out, especially when it is grounded in any part of um, the scriptures. And I think it's even more complicated after October 7th and Hamas's attack on Israel, and then Israel's continuing um, and overwhelming attack on the civilians in Gaza and the humanitarian crisis that that has created. And I think one can talk about that and the decisions of the um, political parties in Israel without being anti-Semitic, without being necessarily anti-Semitic. So I want to say all that as the context to set up what we will hear um, in John chapter 12. Let us pray. Gracious God, our way in the wilderness, guide us by your word through these 40 days and minister to us with your Holy Spirit so that we may be reformed, restored, and renewed. Amen. So the reading is John chapter 12, verses 1 through 16. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church today. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray Jesus, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So the religious authorities planned to put Lazarus to death as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the Passover festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Holy God, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. 
the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So during Lent, several of us have been reading Luther Smith's book titled, Hope is Here, Spiritual Practices for Pursuing Justice and Beloved Community. And the last of the five spiritual practices that Smith writes about is celebrating community. He writes, community is where we come alive to ourselves and our purpose in creation. And celebrations are where community sings itself into new life. Celebrations are where community members open their hearts to the transformative power of gathering, eating together, testimony about the journey, laughter, tears, rejoicing, and gratitude. Now, when I read celebrations in the book, my mind went to parties, happy occasions, great music, something upbeat and enthusiastic. Then Smith describes celebrations as a form of communal Sabbath. Communal Sabbath. But Sabbath puts me more in the direction of rest and simplicity, doing less, laying down work. Smith explains celebrations are a form of spiritual retreat from and for our creative efforts as we witness for justice and beloved community. Celebrations are a form of spiritual retreat from and for our creative efforts as we bear witness to justice and beloved community. So I've been holding all that as I lived with this story that starts out with a dinner party from John 12. Now in chapter 11, Lazarus had died. And Jesus came and raised Lazarus from the dead. And the religious and political leaders were not happy about that at all. And they conspire together with the political leaders to put Jesus to death. Not long after Lazarus was raised, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha host this party, this dinner event, for their dear friend Jesus. They are celebrating community, gathering together to celebrate their friend Jesus and their now alive friend and brother Lazarus. I imagine there was friendly chatter, probably some exuberance about Lazarus being with them, some great food, laughter, and maybe even some tears, tears of joy. At the same time, certainly, Jesus and Lazarus, and I would assume also Mary and Martha, know that the religious and political leaders are plotting to kill Jesus. And so what I also hear in this story are the opening notes of the theme song from the movie Jaws, a movie I've never seen, but I certainly have that music signaling danger in my brain, as you may also. Luther Smith writes, celebrating community is not just when there are wins. Our celebrating cannot wait until our goals for justice and shalom and beloved community are achieved. I remember an activist friend teaching me that we need to celebrate our small wins because the big ones take a really, really long time with a lot of hard work. Small wins include the work we do together and the relationships that are forged. Even when we have lost a particular goal, that work and those relationships will continue to ground us and engage us in the work. So it feels really poignant to me and important that Jesus and his friends gather to share a meal together at a time like this. And Mary, knowing the danger ahead for Jesus, anointed Jesus with the perfume that a person would use to care for a person's body at the time of death. 
Well, there is tension that Judas points out between Mary's beautiful act of devotion and love and a world thick with danger. Judas criticizes Mary's action. The narrator tells us Judas had self-serving motives, but Jesus, in affirming Mary's discipleship, also responds in a way that could feel very cold-hearted. I wonder if Jesus wants to remind us when he says, the poor will always be with you, I will not always be with you. I wonder if he wants to remind us, as the writer of Ecclesiastes says, there is a time for everything. There is a time for work. There is a time for rest. There is a time to feed others and a time to be fed by God. There is a time to accompany those who are suffering and a time to let ourselves be accompanied. None of these are either or. They are both and. They are part of the whole. Now, outside the house of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, a crowd is now growing. They have come to see Jesus, but even more, they have come to see Lazarus, this man raised from the dead, which no one has ever seen or heard of before. It makes me kind of think of those old carnival shows where they had like odd people in cages. People pay to stare at them. People are peering in the door and the windows of the house trying to get a picture, a glimpse of this oddity, Lazarus. Which, that big gathering, that interest in Jesus and Lazarus, this amazement at what has happened, threatens the power of the religious and political leaders, so now they plan to kill Lazarus as well as Jesus. Now, in a situation like this, I think it would be totally un understandable if Mary, Martha, and Lazarus decided not to have a dinner party. The danger they are in because they, along with Jesus, have threatened the power of the powerful, that is real danger. And it could convince people to lay low, not to gather, to scatter, to disappear for a while. There is something subversive, and I think revolutionary, about celebrating community in the midst of threat. It can draw people together, and courage is built in community. It's easy to be afraid on your own. In gathering together, they took, they shared a meal, they talked about the story of what had happened, and Mary took action which recognized the danger Jesus and all of them were in. And she performed a communal ritual of death to strengthen Jesus and their friends for what was coming. And they said to the powers that be, you cannot break us apart easily. Now the next day, there is more to unnerve the powerful people as the crowd reconvenes to meet Jesus as he comes into Jerusalem to be part of the Passover festival. Everything in this scene is political. The palm branches are used to mark victory and celebration in a war. The crowd greets Jesus with hosannas, which we may think of as like alleluia, a rousing celebratory word, but it was not. Instead, hosanna is a plea that means save us. We are in danger. There is trouble all around. Save us. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the holy God is the language used to speak of the coming Messiah. The crowd calls Jesus King of Israel, which would be an affront to the established religious and political rulers of Israel. The crowd sees in Jesus someone who can save them from the political 
and economic and cultural oppression they experience under the rule of the Roman Empire. Save us, Hosanna. And Jesus participates in this alternate political rally. He finds a donkey to ride on alongside the crowd. A king who wanted to show off his power would ride a big horse and be accompanied by soldiers. Jesus, traveling on his own in the presence of the crowd, declares that the kind of king he will be declares the kind of king he will be as he rides a young donkey. As the prophet Zechariah said, lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey. He shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Probably part of the dominion that Rome assumed they had. There is no violence in this scene. There was no violence in raising Lazarus from the dead. Yet violence will be heaped upon Jesus in the most horrifying means of torture and execution known to humanity at the time. And I was reminded of Kelly Brown Douglas's writing in her book, Resurrection Hope, A Future Where Black Lives Matter, which we read during Lent last year. She says, Jesus was nailed to the cross because he protested the oppressive political, social, cultural, and religious systems and structures of his day even as he bore witness to God's promised, just future. That he was crucified indicates the threatening nature of his protests in regard to those who held oppressive and coercive power. Therefore, they wanted to get rid of him. That Jesus did not resist his crucifixion reveals his solidarity with the subjugated, dominated, marginalized classes of people of his day in their struggle for life and freedom. The crucifying realities that they could not avoid in their own daily lives, Jesus did not avoid when it came to his crucifixion. Brown Douglas continues, the love that is God's presence is neither passive nor tepid when it comes to injustice. As revealed in Jesus, it is confrontational and passionate. Throughout Jesus' whole ministry, he affirms the sacred dignity of the lowly as he disavowed the rule of the powerful. Again and again, he upended the status quo. And in doing so, Jesus re re released God's love as a dynamic movement in history that confronts again and again the forces of unjust power. However, systems of power and structure, systems and structures of unjust power rarely, if ever, surrender quietly. Consequently, the violence that is intrinsic and, in, and essential to injustice itself was unleashed, culminating in Jesus' crucifixion. Our gospel story began with celebrating community, and soon it will end with death and the ripping apart of community. This is not the end of the story, but it is where we will pause today. And next week we will hear the end of the story, which truly is not the end, but a beginning.
come now to the point in worship when we pray for each other and those around us. Please join me in prayer. God, there are many ways we ask for your help today. We pray for our world, for the people in Gaza, Israel, Ukraine, and Russia. We pray for our country, that our elected leaders will make sound decisions that respect the rights of all of us, not just the wealthy few. We pray for our neighbors and ourselves, that everyone will have what they need for a healthy, happy life. We also pray today for Don, who is gaining strength in rehab for Kathy as she provides care and support. For Stan, who was hospitalized this week. For Phil, who has surgery this week and is recovering. We give thanksgiving for the birth of Tori and Matt's son, who was born on Monday, and prayers for them in their new family of three. We pray for Mahala, who's testing for Krav Maga self-defense today, of course. We pray for the family of Charlie Hines, who passed this week. We pray for Cindy, who's had pain related to her back. And we pray for healing for Jordan Gould, who's in ICU after a car accident. And now we continue our prayer using the words that are closest to our heart, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you were in attendance at our annual meeting, you would have heard some notes of hope about the future of this church. We're grateful today for new members, for births, and baptisms. We know that our financial gifts make the many arms of our mission work. There's information in the bulletin board about how to make a contribution so that we may continue this work in our building and in our neighborhood. As we continue the story of this week we call Holy, I'll be reading from sections of Mark 15. The religious leaders bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He answered, you say so. Then the religious leaders accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you? But Jesus made no further reply. Now at the festival, Pilate used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now a man called Barabbas was in prison with the insurrectionists who had committed murder during the insurrection. Then Pilate asked them, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? But the religious leaders stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again, then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace. They clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews! After mocking him, they led him out to crucify him. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him, and with him they crucified two rebels, one on his right and one on his left. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Hoses, and Salome, who followed him when he was in Galilee and ministered to him. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the realm of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of rock. He then rolled a stone against the tomb of the door. Let us pray. 
Merciful God, as we enter Holy Week and gather in your house of prayer, turn our hearts again to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Bring us at the last with Christ and all the faithful to your just future, your commonwealth of peace and justice and freedom for all. Amen.
Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, for every blessing and spiritual gift you have poured out upon us. Let the gifts of our lives be a source of blessing in your world, all to the glory of your holy name. Amen.
Friends, in all the circumstances of our lives, the love of God, the presence of Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit are with us now and always. So go in peace. And all God's people said, 